Hey everybody, it's Mama Kay coming back at you from her home studio in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And I can't believe I'm at interview number 50. And what an interview it's going to be. It is the golden interview. I'm so happy that this person has agreed to talk to me. I know that they're a huge advocate for music education here in Manitoba. And so without further ado, extra special guest, who are you? Hi, I'm James Bedford. I'm uh, president of the Manitoba Teachers Society. It's uh, it's an honor to uh, to be here today, to be number fifty. And and I've looked at some of your uh, your past interviews, and uh, it is a real honor uh, to be included in that group. Thanks so much, James, for agreeing to doing this. And I know you and I sort of talked a little bit before, and you emailed me about how um, you're not a particularly musical family in the sense of being big performance wise or going for lots of lessons um, but i i know that your family is hugely involved in music in a variety of ways so can you sort of maybe explain to us uh what how your family is involved sure i i, I take no credit for this at all um i'm i have not a musical bone in my body uh but i'm uh I'm, I'm very honored to be uh married to a woman who has a beautiful singing voice she sang at our wedding and uh i think it is it's it, it's been something that stuck with me for life uh she sings in church choirs she sings with her sisters and that sort of passed down i think the musical genes into our children um, they've all uh, they've all sung and uh, performed in musical dinner theater uh, at church, and that's that, that was uh, uh, quite a, an occasion within our family because you all have to get involved in terms of getting them to practices and whatnot. Uh, it's our middle daughter uh, Janelle, who is the uh, the real accomplished musician. Um, now she corrected me last night. She's working on her uh, level seven piano with the Royal Conservatory of Music. Um, and uh, she fills the house when, uh, when she plays piano. And it's just, I, I turn off everything else and just listen to it because it's marvelous. Uh, our youngest daughter, who's uh, grade 11 at River East Collegiate, um, she's teaching herself guitar. Um, I think she's, she's uh, very social with her friends. And I think she really likes the idea when they're, when they're together in the backyard of just being able to pull the guitar out, I think, and, and just play a few chords while they're all singing some song. And, uh, and our oldest, um, well, I'll give credit, her fiance, our, our oldest fiance gave the guitar to our youngest daughter. So there's something in there, but, uh, but our oldest, you know, started piano, can still play a few keys on the keyboard, but, but that's it. Um, none of them did music in school beyond, uh, beyond just elementary school, uh, but that doesn't mean, I think, that there isn't that appreciation for music. And so your daughter, your daughter who's playing guitar, did she start learning guitar before all of this isolation started? Oh yeah, she's been at it I think for a year now. And she just watches YouTube videos. I mean, it's just, um, it, it, it's something that I think she just sort of decided she needed to do. She's one of these kids that always needs to be busy doing something. I'm trying to get her busy cutting the grass this summer. <laughs> And your daughter, who is uh, doing working towards her grade seven, her with her RCM exam. She's how long has she been taking private lessons for? Oh, I'm gonna say my wife needs to be here to, to actually correct it, but but I think uh, probably around the time that she started grade school. Oh wow! Yeah, she 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 loves it. I think she loves the challenge of playing. Um, she loves to play music. They're big fans of the musical Hamilton. Uh, of course, gift, it is fantastic. A gift a few years ago at Christmas was uh, the oldest uh, gave her next younger sibling a ticket to see Hamilton in Chicago <gasps> and uh, in the summer. And, and, you know, dad's comment was, how are you getting to Chicago? And he said, well, <laughs> you're taking us. And that was it. And, and she's smart. I mean, I give, I, I give all her kids credit for being quite brilliant. Her next comment was, you can go and see the Cubs play. I said, oh, that's right. I'd love to see the Cubs play. So we're all off to Chicago. And uh, two of them went to see Hamilton. The three of us, the other three, 
went to see the Cubs play and uh, we all said we had a better time than the other group. So uh, Janelle plays uh, music from Hamilton. Uh, it's one of the things she loves to do. We, my daughter and I uh, saw Hamilton in Minneapolis a couple of years ago, and it was it was incredible. Chris went off and did something else. Well, well, she and I went, and it was yeah, it was three hours where you just by the end of it, you were just shocked you'd been sitting there for three hours. I I, I would gather so. I mean, we were regular symphony goers. Um, we're regulars at, at RMTC. Um, we probably get to a concert maybe every other year but the time flies when you're there. Um, we love the Winnipeg Jazz Orchestra. Um, and, and the thing I love about the Jazz Orchestra concerts is there's almost uh, always a, a high school jazz band there, uh, pre-performance. And uh, you often recognize uh, the leaders of, uh, of those groups. And we have several members who play in the Jazz Orchestra as well. There is a huge, music community here in Winnipeg. Um, and it's so funny because we tend to stick together, right? You know, whether we're best friends with each other, whether we end up marrying each other, we're, we're a pretty yeah. tight group that, that continually makes music together too. It's, um, and it's great to hear that you support so many musical things that are happening in Winnipeg, even though your kids didn't really go, were performing in band or jazz band or anything like that, you know the value of music education. Well, the, the thing I worry about, and, and like we, we, you, you touched on it briefly in terms of the art scene in, in Winnipeg, one of the things currently that if you look about what's going on in COVID-19 in other provinces, and, and it was pointed out to me uh, by someone in the city, even Doug Ford in Ontario is supporting the arts through some of the provincial support work that's happening. We're not seeing that to the same level and in the same form in Manitoba. And I'm really fearful of will institutions like the symphony, like RMTC, like the jazz orchestra, will they survive? Uh, Folk Fest, uh, you know, my, my oldest and her fiance always go out to Folk Fest. Um, we are the, we're, we're the sort of the, the shower facility when it gets really hot at Folk Fest, they can quickly get into our place and cool off and run back and we've also been known maybe to make some food runs out for them. But will Folk Fest manage? And, and we made a specific point of donating to Folk Fest because it needs to be around. It's important. But these arts groups that rely on a few events throughout the year to provide their funding and their support, where are they gonna reach out to to get that funding? Because it's not happening in a way that I think it needs to with the provincial government right now. And, and I think it's, it's commensurate. I mean, we renewed our symphony tickets without knowing what it's gonna be in the fall, but we didn't bat an eye for doing it because we want the symphony there. We need the symphony there. Of course, we did the same thing. We're um, Tom Hendry warehouse subscribers as well as uh, symphony subscribers. And it's just, no, let's donate our tickets back and not ask for a refund and just, they're so important to what Winnipeg is. Well, they are, and, and they're at a completely different level than professional sports. And I don't begrudge professional sports at all, but when you're dealing with professional sports, be it the Gold Eyes, the, the Bombers, or the Jets, you're talking about thousands, if not tens of thousands of people at each performance. When you're talking about the arts, and the thing that we love about the arts is the intimacy of, of the performance and the intimacy of the venues. Um, you only need to go to Fringe to experience that, but you don't get tens of thousands of people out at a concert for the symphony. You get a few thousand people out, so they're far more dependent and in a far greater precarious financial situation. So I think it, it, it's important that we're out there uh, to support them in any way we can. It's exciting to see what New Zealand has done, though, with uh, how they're going to be supporting their arts. Like, they're just, now that they're on the other end of things, I think they're beyond 17 days without a new case, yeah. right? Um, their, their political leadership really understands the value of, of arts in their country. I have a friend out there who's a, who's a prof at, at uh, a jazz prof at the university, and uh, he's, just, he's just thrilled with what he's seeing. 
Well, I wonder if it has to do with leadership. One of the dinner table conversations, we have great dinner table conversations in our house. One of the conversations was about how countries with female leaders or leaders who identify as female have generally fared much better during COVID-19 than countries with male leaders. Now, with many more male leaders, there's that possibility that you get many more extremes within the leadership. But I think New Zealand has greatly benefited by their uh, prime minister. She, is, she seems to be articulate, intelligent, making right decisions. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with that. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. You know, you just, you, you, you hope to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, you strive to make the right decisions, obviously. Absolutely. Um, so James, before you became president of, of MTS, in your life as a teacher, what, what did you do? What did you sort of, what did you see um, in your students that were in, involved in music? Well, I've always, I've, I spent my whole career teaching high school, uh, physics, general science, uh, occasionally math, but I'd, I'd never really claimed to be a math teacher. Um, so one of the things, and, and you know, when you do science, and, and in particular when you do physics, um, I, I always wanted to interact with my students, find out something about them. And uh, obviously, like any course, you get a range of ability in your classroom. But whenever I had students who just got physics, and you don't, you, you don't do a lot of physics before grade 11 physics, where, where it first becomes its own course. So you're always a little bit curious about what really clicked to make you a really good student in physics. So I'd always ask, and very often the response was that they were accomplished musicians. There's something about being uh, accomplished at music, whether it's within the school, within the public education system, or whether it's, it's through private lessons or sometimes they just come by it naturally. But more often than not, there seemed to be a connection between music and doing well in, in physics. I think the same thing is true with math. It's, it's, uh, it, it, I think it must be a way of organization in the brain. Uh, I find that they were always outstanding problem solvers. It's very true with, with, our, own, uh, with our own children. Um, I, I would never say that they don't all have musical ability, uh, and they've certainly all done fairly well at school, uh, middle daughter exceptionally well. And I think there's something about the music that, that organizes the mind, trains the mind, they can recognize patterns, and often in problem solving, that pattern recognition is just essential. I think it would be course, very, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, the, the greatest things happen, and, and I was always a teacher that, that wanted to advocate for doing things a little bit differently if we could. So I, I taught at Dakota Collegiate, a very, very large school in the city. So we had nine or 10 sections of grade 10 science, and probably I think four of us typically taught together. And we would try to, to meet regularly, talk about teaching strategies, and uh, you would, we do a lot of inquiry learning where we could, uh, presentation work where we could, and every so often you'd have some students come forward and do something musical, uh, often sort of pre-recorded on video, not very often live in the classroom. And that, you just listen to it and you're like, wow, like this is great stuff. I mean, they're bringing, they're bringing wonderful ideas in, they're bringing music into the classroom. And the biggest thing is, they're getting the message across, they're getting the learning across. Um, so curious about who was the band teacher when you were teaching at Dakota? Darren Ritchie. Darren, excellent. Did you ever yes. meet Marlene Trichel? Was she there when you were there at all? No, she was there she right, right before Darren. Yeah, she preceded me there. No, I, I know Darren, actually, I'm trying to think the last time I saw Darren, I think was uh, with the Winnipeg Jazz Orchestra. I know, yeah, he's been a member of that group for a very long time. Yes, yeah. Exceptionally talented, um, great teacher, great member, great colleague. You know, it just, it, it, it's so well-rounded in a lot of areas and um, always very modest. And I'd say this about most of, of uh, the music teachers that I've ever worked with, very modest. And, and I would say, you know, all I have to do is teach students 
you know, how to problem solve, a bit of kinematics, a bit of wave motion. Um, you know, I always think that's easy compared to teaching them how to play an instrument. And then on top of it, teaching 30 or 40 students to all play their instruments so it sounds good together. Um, and uh, to me, that's just, that's amazing. I don't know how they do it. It's just, you know what, um, you learn when they're, beautiful means different things in when you teach band, right? There's a diff, there's a version of beautiful for grade six when they hit that first note together compared to when they're in grade eight and it's their final concert, right? It's the same, beautiful is the word for it, but it's a whole different level, right? It's like, to me, one of my favorite times of the entire year is, is the first time a class plays that first note together, no matter what it sounds like, but the fact that they're yeah. putting themselves out there, they're being so brave, they know it's probably not going to be perfect, but they're trying, right? Everyone's trying together. Like it's, yeah, yeah I, I, would, I am, I'm a little afraid that, that this fall is going to look different that way, right? That the kids maybe won't have that same experience. Yes, I, I don't think we know what music's going to look like in the fall. I think the government has said band is okay, but not band as a course. I think they're thinking of band is okay that the local pipe band can get together and, and can parade uh, and, and play their instruments together outdoors. Um, what it's going to look like in the school, we don't know. and and. I share your concern, but I actually share, maybe there's a broader concern and I don't, I, I'm not here to get your listeners too concerned, but it, it, I, I can't help but not raise the concern, which is I've, I've always seen uh, teaching of music as an essential in the public school. You know, it, it's as important to teach music as it is to, anything else that we teach. And, and perhaps it's not for every student, but it needs to be there so that students can discover if they've got the talent, if they discover if they've got the skill, they need to discover if they enjoy doing it. In the broader scope of things, I think public schools are potentially more seen as reading, writing, arithmetic, the sciences, uh, read the classics, and all these things are critically important, but music is just as important. And if we go into the fall where somehow we can accept the idea that because of COVID-19, we can't be singing in an enclosed environment, we can't be playing instruments together in an enclosed environment, I hope that doesn't cause us to question music in the public school system. Uh, because it needs to be there. there. There's just no question at all that it needs to be there. And I think we really have to become advocates. If, if, it, if it means we have to rethink how we do it for a short period of time, then that's what we need to do. But we have to make sure that we're advocating so that we don't lose music from the school system. And I know I've spoken to many music teachers who through this period of you know, emergency remote teaching and learning are looking at how are they keeping musical learning going? And they've mm -hmm. been doing it in, in, in some amazing ways, but they're really working hard to make sure that you know, music education continues. I know a lot of the grade eights in our school, they were, I mean, pretty much everybody that was supposed to be putting on a musical this spring, they didn't get a chance to, and kids are just devastated. Yeah. Right. It's like this for some of them, this is their thing. This is their outlet. This is their safe place to express who they are. And, and it's, it's just been cut short. So, yeah, I can't even imagine for for kids not to have that opportunity in this. Point. Well, this is where James, the academic teacher, really envies what you do, because um, the most I can do is, is I can get excited in front of a class of students when they've all done well on a project, an assignment, a test, a final exam, whatever it is, I can get excited in front of those students. I can make phone calls home because I was that teacher who phoned home and said, you know, your daughter is in my physics class. And it was immediately, well, you can't be calling because she's a good student. She did well. And I said, well, no, I'm actually calling to tell you she got 98% in her final exam. This rarely happens, but I can't do that to a larger audience. And then actually in today's teaching environment, 
we're not allowed to promote academic achievement the way we once did. You have the opportunity in front of a gymnasium, a theater, or parents to put what your students have done on display for that whole community. And I'm sure that you, you have the occasion uh, when it's not just their parents, but when you open up your facility and invite seniors in, uh, I, I've been a part of that in some of the schools I've worked in and the reception is just amazing. And, and these are people who aren't necessarily any relationship to the students playing. They just have an appreciation of what you can achieve. You get to do it really publicly. And I envy that. That's, that's so neat to be able to do. It's very special. I, I love when we put on concerts and the beauty of it is that you never know what's going to happen. We may have to restart. It may not be perfect, but you do it together. And it's that shared joy, that shared experience that, that, that really hits, it hits so many wonderful things for so many people, right? Like you'll never forget. If you wanted perfection, I guess there's a way to use technology and recreate all the music, but it doesn't, literally it doesn't feel the same way. I mean, when, when you, you can listen to music at home, but when you're there in the concert hall, listening to the symphony you can feel the music inside of you in a way that you can't in any other in any other venue and then it's it, the fun part is actually watching the people play and that that in itself is, is a is an experience absolutely james i think you need to take up an instrument my brother who's uh, nine years older than i am at just about my age took up the bagpipes uh, he plays in, in the Anavets Pipe Band. Uh, they actually, with proper social distancing, uh, a month or so ago, they marched by his home and, uh, and paraded to uh, celebrate his birthday. Um, I've been strongly hinted at that perhaps playing bagpipes is not, uh, is not necessarily uh, what, uh, what the instrument I should be doing. Um, I tinker with the piano from time to time, and uh, I do have a daughter who uh, I think would be happy to uh, to teach me some piano skills, so I might do that. Uh, we'll see. I, I have so many other hobbies that keep me busy as well. Um, it's it to me the 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 fun part. Um, the the neat thing about music, and and at Dakota Collegiate, one of the classes I taught. Uh, was a uh, was an EAL English or uh, EAL science class English as an additional language for uh, newcomers to Canada, and you know it it it's looking back on it the most fun class that I've ever taught. You have a whole range of, of students of many many different cultures, um, smaller class so you can really get to know the students and emphasize things, and I I remember there is a student. Uh, in the class, and I cannot remember distinctly from what country he, he came from, but somewhere in, in the Middle East, and uh, his name was Jude. And obviously, being a Beatles fan, obviously, the initial conversation is, oh, that's, uh, I don't teach many Judes. Um, any chance your parents were Beatles fans? And his English wasn't great, but he looked up Beatles and said, oh, Parents love them. Oh, eight <laughs> Beatles. And that, once the conversation got in, slow as it was, that's the origin of his name. And it makes you think, like music is international. It reaches everybody. And it, it helps break down barriers. And, and um, that's something we need to do more of you know, within well, our, our society. I my friend Neil Watson runs the bridge program out of, I believe it is, oh my goodness, I'm having a brain fart now. Hugh John McDonald. Okay. Yeah, and I believe uh, the Manitoba teacher even did an article on him. Um, and yeah, that's his, his entire program is with brand new immigrants who either don't know the language or know very minimal and they don't know how to play an instrument. And the things he does are just phenomenal. But music is international. Exactly. Like there, there, there's no, there's no English music or German music or, or uh, Thai music. It's all, it's, it's, it's notes that I think anybody could play and understand. It, it brings, I think it brings people together. It does. Um, and as I said, it, it, it would be a shame, you know, to lose that. And you look at 
much of what's going on in, in social activism around the world today and music, there's a core of music to that. Uh, the union movement, I mean, there's great union fight songs uh, over the years. I mean, uh, that's what Springsteen's Youngstown is all about. It, it's, a, it, it, it's a dissertation of uh, social inequality, uh, particularly between working class and wealthy uh, throughout uh, the history of, of the United States. Like to me, it's, it's the ultimate tribute to rich and poor and, and, and how uh, the working class has, has been used to create massive wealth. And then they've simply been abandoned because, well, I can go make my money somewhere else. So I'm just gonna abandon all of you, even though you've, you've given me everything that I've had or everything that I have today. Um, that's, that's the critical piece uh, to me about music. And I think it, 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 it tells a story and really important stories. We need to keep doing that. Even if it won't be me singing and not likely me <laughs> playing that instrument, I'll be, I'll be listening to it. James, thank you for being such a huge supporter of music education in Manitoba and musical performances in Manitoba. Uh, I think we all need that right now. And thank you for taking time today to talk to me. It's always great to talk to you. And uh, I, feel, I feel very lucky that I probably get to talk to you a little more often than a lot of people just in involvement with SODA and MTS and through Chris. And yeah, just always great to talk to you. Well, I'm always available to talk to all members. I think sometimes um, they forget, although one of the great things through the COVID experience is that uh, more members, and I think it's just because of how we're communicating, more members are picking up the phone and, and simply calling and talking. And uh, it's something that I, I don't think a president of, of the society can do enough of. So, so it, it's really enjoyable. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for, for not just doing this, but you're involved in your local executive. Uh, I think you're involved with the music teachers in Manitoba. Um, all of that work is, is critically important because it brings that broader experience uh, to so many different people. And if it wasn't for the things that make us different, I don't think we would all feel you know, connected. So, so you're helping create those, uh, those connections within our community and that's hugely valuable. So thanks for that. And as I said, one of the most fun interviews I've done. The only <laughs> one that was equally fun was the CJNU interview I did where music played a role there too, because in that interview, I was asked to come up with five, uh, five pieces of music uh, to play during, uh, during the, uh, I guess, the intermissions in the interview. And there had to be a bit of a story behind each piece. And I enjoyed doing that too. When did you do that? Uh, sometime in the last three weeks, I think. You know, time flies when you're in the midst of a crisis and, uh, <laughs> and, and you do uh, a whole lot of interviews, but it's, yeah, I think it's there on file, uh, it's there on file somewhere. All pre-1978 music too. So. Ooh, fantastic. I'll have to check that out. Maybe we'll put that, in the, we'll put that in the, in the YouTube notes here as to what your songs were. <laughs> <laughs> please do, please do. And if you can't find it, I think I've, I, I think I could still remember uh, all the songs. But, can you uh, can you tell us what they are off the top of your head? Off the top of my wall, Hey Jude by the Beatles, um, uh, In the Early Morning Rain by uh, Lightfoot, um, um, Radar Love by Golden Earring. Right. Um, trying to think. Um, uh, Bob Seeger, a uh, big Seeger fan, uh, Turn the Page. Is that cover all five. I think there's, there's one, more. one more. Oh, one more. I'll have to I'll have to think back. I can't remember what the last one was. Um, sort of a, a common thing, all music that I enjoy, but when you're in this job, you, you under normal circumstances, you do a lot of driving. Yeah. And I certainly haven't been doing that the last couple of months, but um, I have satellite radio in the car, so I can have a variety of music, but in particular, some of the older rock, and that's what you listen to when you're, you know, you're in Russell, Manitoba, and it's 7.30 at night after <laughs> uh, an annual meeting, and you want to be home that night. You want to sleep in your own bed. So it's the music that gets you home. And, uh, and that's where I, I, I 
I remember a lot of these songs from, not from my childhood, but from last year or the year before uh, making those drives in. So it, it's fun, but there, there's music, it gets you through every day. Absolutely. Now you got me thinking, what was that fifth song? But, me, unless I added it up wrong. <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't. I have a feeling I was only at four. Um, and and, and, and it's, I, I don't keep scraps of paper around, but mm -hmm. CJ and you, I, I think the interview is probably around somewhere uh, because this is a day and age where they can record and post everything. So Absolutely. we'll have to track down that one. This <laughs> James, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. And thank you so much one more time for taking time with us today. You too, Joanne, it's been enjoyable. Take care. You too.